Welcome to Business Talk, presented in collaboration with the University of Rio Grande and the Ohio State University South Centers, from the heart of southeastern Ohio at the University of Rio Grande TV studio. Our goals are simple, promote the University of Rio Grande and the Ohio State University South Centers, as well as advocate local small business and their support organizations. More importantly, promote Southeastern Ohio as a wonderful place to live, explore, and learn. There are many different ways you can find us. The University of Rio Grande Cable Access Channel 17, live online at blogtalkradio.com, and on YouTube if you are unable to catch our show live. Introducing our co-hosts, Jason Winters, Mike Thompson, Patrick Dingle. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy the show. Hey, welcome back to our show. Hey, we have an interesting uh, guest today, uh, Bob Bob Hood. Uh, we're going to get into Bob Hood. You know, his his business is HT Marketing, and but Bob, j just yes or no? Isn't the way a person looks? Isn't that the most important thing in marketing? Absolutely. Okay, and it goes with. Uh, uh, sort of proves my point I had a chance to look at the last video that uh, uh, we, we have put on and I happen to notice that Mike is now going to get a new studio uh, they are moving you to uh, Woodhull uh, and they're putting in a brand new studio for Mike and I think that's about time yeah Be yeah I'm putting in a new studio yes. hopefully yes <laughs> and, and uh, because this studio makes your hair look a lot lighter than what it really is you know i'm i sort of look, looked at my hair going wow yeah and if you didn't know better you'd swear i gained 10 pounds well yeah yeah, yeah. and it, it has to do with the cameras and the lighting so and it I'm could be worse <laughs> it could be like me yeah we're, we're going for the slim cams <laughs> slim on top or <laughs> Well, uh, I, I'd like for it to come back to my natural brown hair that I that I have. There are products that will help with that. <laughs> <laughs> a time machine works wonders too. Yeah. Oh, well, that's that's true. But anyway, we were talking about marketing. Uh, it's uh, uh, always a pleasure to have Bob Hood. Bob Hood uh, has a, a number of different life experiences that uh, has helped him to be involved in the HT marketing. And it was interesting how he arrived, and maybe we'll have a chance for Bob to tell us a little bit about how HT Marketing Services started. But uh, you, you had your start in 2001? Correct. Following the fire at Haskins Tanner in, uh, in August of 2001, uh, I, was, I had my resume out there, and I was interviewing for a lot of different jobs. And I was still sort of had my foot in the clothing industry. Uh, I still had the retailers and manufacturers who were calling me, wanting to know were we going to reopen, were we going to rebuild, what you know, what were we going to do. And so I kept contact in contact with all of those manufacturers, and I would keep them at, at arm's length, and I would call them from time to time and say, you know, here's here's the deal. And so I was able to uh, launch launch onto several of those. Uh, and launch my business from that once I once I really grasp a hold of those uh, manufacturers and worked with them and said hey you know I want to start my own company and they said we'll be glad to work with you well, well that's rather interesting let's see you were in the clothing store from 1985 to 2001 and right unfortunately there was a uh, a fire that and how long how long had your family been associated with that I was the fifth generation and uh, so Haskins Tanner was formed in 1866 Okay. And uh, the Haskinses and the Tanners um, were actually the Haskins family was uh, was in it from the very beginning, and uh, they partnered with the Tanner family, and then later the Haskins family bought out the Tanners, and and my dad was uh, a part of the of the Haskins family. My my okay. uh, grandmother was a Haskins, and so it was a, just I was the fifth generation to come along and to be part of that uh, business. Yeah, so that's a very long legacy. And the kind of clothes that that you marketed, we you know it, it it was kind of interesting because we had a large clientele and we would go from A to Z with our clientele. So we had our largest account by far was Levi, and uh, you know we would have people come in and they would want to buy jeans, and and denim shirts and belts and 
so forth. But then we had that other dress up consumer, and we had um, we sold top of the line uh, clothing like uh, Hart Schaffner and Marks and, and Kingsridge and and um, and really top of the line suits. And we had five or six different suit manufacturers, all the way from five hundred dollars for a suit down to one hundred and twenty five. So we were kind of a broad across the uh, spectrum for customers, but. Later, Levi became so, um, they got into the market for everything. They even actually got into the dress wear and went to suits and some, some dress pants and casual pants. That really wasn't their forte, and they didn't really remain in that business for a very long time. But they did at one time. The, they, they thought they could sell to every single person. Yeah, in the they, late 70s, they even had jean, jean suits. Exactly. And, and I really miss that in Gal Police, uh, something of the higher quality. Every it seems like all the businesses we have at least to buy uh, clothing are always bargain basement value whatever. If you're looking for a nice quality, I'm not sure that you can find that close. And you have to look without around. going at the mall. You have to look around, and we were very fortunate to be able to offer a customer if you want Levi or if you want dress shirts or if you want ties or if you want casual shoes or if you want belts or whatever. Um, that we're so well versed and when you talk about corporate apparel today it means a lot of different things in a lot of different in industries so let's talk a little bit about business casual what is business casual today business casual and that's a wide variety a wide name in it itself is. a broad broad title business casual business casual originally went to just no tie mm -hmm. originally business casual was a dress shirt and dress slacks and usually on Fridays and then they went to jeans on Friday and now a lot of companies and, and we talked uh, Jason before we came on really where you work dictates what you're going to wear yeah, there are some people who say hey we, you you still need to wear a suit every day uh, but there are others who say hey jeans is fine dockers are fine dress slacks khakis or whatever um, but in business and also business attire also can mean logo attire as well right so if you work for a corporation um, you know you might be able to they might say to you hey we don't care if whatever shirt you wear if you don't wear a dress shirt and tie you have to wear a shirt that says University of Rye Grand mm -hmm. or wherever you work mm -hmm. um, and that's the way that that business casual took off um, you wanted to um, you say, okay, you can relax the tie, but you have to you have to wear, you have to market my name. So you have to wear our name on your shirt. Then what happened, taking off of that as a spinoff, I had one of the most unusual requests at Haskins Tanner. A gentleman came in to me and said, he brought me in every color shirt that was imaginable under the rainbow. And he said, I want the same color of logo thread on each shirt. So for example, on a blue shirt, I want my logo to be blue. On a black shirt, I want my logo to be black. On a red shirt, I want my logo to be red. And I thought to myself, well, that's kind of odd. So I asked him. I was very curious. And I said to him, okay, why? And he said, that is so that when I'm at my work, I meet the requirements. When I leave and take my wife to dinner, no one knows that I'm there. No one knows that I work there. They don't ask me all these questions. And it really proved effective. It really caught on. And it really, uh, it was really a great marketing tool for people that kind of wanted to say, okay, I'm, ab I'm abiding by the rules. Here's my logo. But yet, when I don't want to be seen, I'm kind of hidden. It's so not over. Overbearing. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of, so corporate apparel Casual apparel can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And now we have so many dress down days for a dollar. You can wear jeans and mm -hmm. kick cancer or, or give to Relay for Life or whatever. So, Well, let's go to the other end of that. We talk about a lot with our students interviewing. What are you supposed to wear to an interview? What is business professional now? You know, I still think, and I'm from the old school, but if I'm going to go for an interview, I'm going to dress up. I don't care. I don't care if it's a manufacturing job. I don't care if it's a job um, in as a as a uh, as a business manager. I don't care if it's a job entry level. I'm going to dress up, and I just think that's is, the is right dressing thing up to do. a suit and tie. Dressing up is there again, depending upon the type of business. But for me, dressing up would be yes, putting on a suit and a tie. Uh, at least so like me, I was an engineer, and I always 
had thought you interview in something more or less what you would come to work in. You know, and not nest. I mean, go back to your. You know, it, it, does, it does go back to the industry, Mike. I mean, if, right. if you're if you're applying for a manufacturing job, right. You know, no one in that manufacturing floor or none of the managers in that manufacturing floor are wearing a suit and tie. However, err on the side of caution. Right. It's always better to be overdressed than to be underdressed. And going back to your comment about interviewing, you know what they always said, the first impression sticks. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if you walk in and you're dressed up, you're, and you're going to be like, that guy's going to be like, yeah, he really cares about this job. He cares about himself. He cares about what he's doing. He cares about me. It shows respect both ways. He, he, he cares about what he's doing. And on the other side, on the flip side, you feel better. So you get up and you get dressed up and you look good. Maybe you have a white shirt on. And you go out and you say, I feel great about myself. And you go into that interview and you say, wow, I am feeling super psyched up today. And there's, there's been people I've seen that's been in suits and it's like, uh, you're kind of awkward. Well, you know, <laughs> there's, there's another side of that. Uh, if, you, if you're not sure, dress, put the suit on. Right. Walk by the interview situation. Peek in. See what your interviewers are wearing. You can always take off a jacket. You can or always whatever. pull. Yeah, absolutely. You can pull a jacket off, or you can pull a tie off. Uh huh. You know. You yeah, can, it's not, easier. It's easier to dress down. You know. Right. Well, then, the, then let me. Ask I wasn't you. offering advice as far as going as you would show up to work. I was just saying that's another idea that people may have. You, you know, we, we we men usually have three or four different styles, but let's let's now. Did so should I start? show up to the interview in my a kilt and dressed up with a tie? Uh, that would depend on where you're working. <laughs> <laughs> but but let's let's talk about. Uh, sure. Were you into uh, female? I was. I was. <laughs> and even at the uh, female dress. Clothing. I assume. <laughs> <laughs> the female clothing. I oh assume. my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Can we put the camera right on Pat? <laughs> show the red face. <laughs> Um, <laughs> oh, that was good. Anyway, yes, by, we, we did. And at the very end of the store, we were even doing some dress clothing and uh, some suits. And, and the company that I carry now for my dress-up clothing does carry women's apparel. And they pair, uh, you know, they carry everything from slacks to, to dress suits to, right. um, to coats. And so, yes, I mean. Uh, See, I, I, I remember when it was uh, considered very, very poor in poor taste for a woman not to wear a skirt right mm -hmm. uh both in school and in, mm -hmm. in various different works and what what is the what is the proper uh etiquette etiquette sure um well go ahead uh, well i think it goes with the job you know i think it, it goes with what kind of a job that you're going to apply for and there again you you learn and do some research about the company beforehand and uh you know, maybe you could call someone that works within that company and say, hey, I'm coming to interview tomorrow. What kind of, give me some tips, what kind of should I wear? And they're going to say, hey, you're interviewing with the CEO, you better dress up. Or, no, well, you know, we don't really dress up around here. You can wear casual. Oh, so okay. I think it goes with the job. Say a few things about skirts. Uh, you know, if, if, a, if a lady is going to wear a skirt to an interview, you know, it, it should not be a mini skirt. It mm -hmm. should be a skirt that does reach the knee. Um, you should, you want your clothes well, you, should, is, you should you should err on the, the side of yeah. conservancy. You don't want people to you notice be more you for your clothing. You want people to notice you for what you can bring to their company. So if your clothes are saying more about you than what you are physically saying about your abilities, like animal then prints are problem. great, right? Well, that would be a problem. <laughs> I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. That's why the two most conservative colors that we have out are blue and black. Sure. You know, if you those are conservative, you can put a blue, you can wear a blue suit, and you can wear any color shirt, mm -hmm. and it looks great. You can wear a black suit, and you can wear a white shirt or a gray shirt or, or a blue shirt, and you can look great with a black suit. So, black and blue and gray are the th three. I guess the three most important. Mm -hmm. uh, gray has kind of um, taken an up and down swing, but yeah. you're always safe with, safe with navy or black or, or gray. But I had a I had a guy at uh, in college that went for a job interview, and he wore a green suit. And he didn't get the job. If and, you're going you to Marshall or you, that'd be great. Well, still, I mean, you wonder <laughs> a green suit. Uh, let's be realistic and think about. You mean this. bright green? Uh, yeah, 
I mean, oh, like fluorescent. Let's, let's be realistic about this. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, it does, like you say, right. they probably looked at him when he went in and said, I'm writing him off right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so you do have mm-hmm. to do some. And, and the other question that I have is hats. Um, it used to be, and we, we saw a TV program, Wanda and I were, were commenting on this, everyone wore a hat. Even yeah, back in the kids. 20s, well, 30s, yeah. 40s, I, 50s. I, 60s. Again, 60s. that gets into industry and that gets into your area of the country. Uh, if you were in Texas, you better have a nice dress hat. A Stetson. Absolutely. <laughs> if you walked into a certain place in Texas for an interview and was not wearing a hat, you might as well turn around and walk out. That is true. And that's more location than industry. Sure. Even here in this part of the state or this part of the region, country, any job, you really wouldn't have to have a hat on unless it was 20 below zero and you wear a hat <laughs> for, you know, the weather. But if, like you said, if you were going somewhere that where hats were predominant, like yeah, a pimp you better, or something, you better get you a hat. <laughs> you, you, you know, in, in, your, in your marketing services, probably the very first thing uh, with your set of eyeballs uh, if you were to go into a business, probably one of the, the greatest things that you have to offer is uh, what kinds of impressions uh, that, that emanate from a, a business. And, you know, when I interview someone, not, not actually going into the business, but let's talk about uh, going back to the interviewing skills for just one thing. One of the things, one of the avenues that I will help you with is resume building. And I will look at your resume and I will say, what, what on a resume separates you from anyone else? Because the number one question that you should be asked in an interview is, tell me why that we should hire you. So if I look at your resume and I'm thinking, well, say, for example, it's handwritten. Uh, I'm probably going to put that right off to the side. I don't care for handwritten resumes. So I get a resume that's five pages long. That goes off to the side. Now, there are things that set you apart from resume building and resume building that, hey, your resume looks sharp. And you can learn about that, you know, online. There's a lot of samples. There's a lot of ways to do things. But um, you, you wouldn't want to misspell a person's name on a resume. You wouldn't you, want to misspell anything you on a resume. You would want to. Uh, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> but feel free to take my class in business. <laughs> I, I've, I've seen that, you know, people. And I have too. I, I actually yeah, sure. have too. Mm-hmm. You, you've got so that's one of the things that I help people with is resume building and how to choose your uh, references. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if if I'm talking to a person and they say, "Hey, I'm going for a job interview," um, you know, who, give me some ideas on who I want my references to be. But. but uh, R- resumes are very good, but I would venture to say with, with your many years' experience in the retail market, in the Visitors, uh, uh, Gallia County Convention and Visitors Bureau, with your, your current position, if you were to walk into a, a new established store, I, I would venture to say you would be able to pick out some of the nice things that make it look attractive and some of the things that, are, that don't. Merchandising is probably number one. So you figure um, how is your mer- how is your product merchandised if you're going to walk into a store. Now, in my case, I don't have a storefront. So my number one thing is customer service. How am I going to take care of the customer because I don't have a storefront? If you go into a storefront, how am I appealing? How is my That's store right. appealing? And, you know, that was one of the things about window trim and window decorating and things like that. You get a first look. You wouldn't believe the amount of people that look at windows during the night when they're out walking, they're shopping, they're looking around Sundays, days when you're not at it open. People walk by your store, they look in, and they say, oh, yeah, you know, they got that. Or, boy, that doesn't look sharp. So, and I, I do that at, like, car lots yeah, or I do too. other places because I don't want to get into the high-pressure sales. I don't want the guy coming out, what am I going to do? How can I sell you a car right now? I just want to browse and pick, you know, just mull it over in my own mind before I get hit with a sales guy. Um, I know uh, there was a business uh, downtown in downtown Gallup Police. They change their window about every th- two to three days. And it's very attracting because they change styles and they change colors. Now, there are only three things in their windows, and they have a big window. But one day they might have all red, catches your eye. Tomorrow they might have a different style, all uh, with different looks. 
you know, and to, then the next day they might have all blue. And it's really eye-catching to, to when you change things. And, you know, uh, if you're a very frequent shopper, you'll notice right away, hey, that's been the same for a month. You know, they must not be moving that because it's been there for a month. Mm -hmm. Or they never move that around. Or, hey, you know, I go back there. Now, people would know when they would walk into Haskins Tanner, our jeans were on the right side. They knew that. They would head, uh, automatically head that way. Hey, uh, we're going to see your jeans. Or they would go to the suits. They were always in the back. And But occasionally, we would have to move that around just because we didn't want stalemate. And, you know, you put your... You put your good, your better stuff in the back so people walk through all the way. And we got to the point where jeans were such a, a hot item that we moved all of our Levi section to the back of the store right. so that they had to walk clear through the store and then they would see other things. Oh, yeah, I need to pick up mm -hmm. that. Oh, I need to pick up that. I need to pick up that. And uh, that's how the larger chains have been, have been mm -hmm. so successful. They put things that you really need in the back so that you have to walk through through your store. That's right. why the bread is always in the back right corner. Uh, I know. I know. You have to go left. through all the, exactly. the good, Absolutely. good items. And, and if maybe you're only going for a gallon of milk. Well, you end up getting 10 things. Before, oh, yeah, I see that. I see that. I see that. Well, well, there, there was a study out, and I don't know if this is true or not, but uh, they, they did a study of people, uh, customers that would go into a store. If they went left, chances are they were just looking if they went to the right they were intent on buying i don't know if that's true or not uh you know, i've never heard that one but it is a it is a natural tendency to automatically go to the right right except that i'm left-handed right yeah but left. you know, I now that does have something to do i'm seriously it does. it does have something to do with it i think left i always have and that's and i am left-handed and I am predominantly 90% left. I do everything left but, side. And what I wonder if 5% of the population is left handed. Yeah, that's exactly but right. So 95% is going to the right. That's exactly right. So where do you want your, where do you want but your 95% of people to come? To I, want, right. I want them to pass the high end merchandise on the right. That's exactly right. I wonder if in England, because they drive on the left side of the road, if they also walk on the left side of the sidewalks and everything else, if they tend to go that direction rather than right, like we do. Well, I don't know. We should have asked some of our students when we had them in here. Yeah. Remember that. We get some of our English MBA students in here later on. We'll ask them that question. Yeah. Because yeah. that, that the sorry. traffic patterns on pedestrians different since so, they do it on the road. So, so I would venture to say you've seen a lot of unique things that individuals do in their storefronts, whether it's a service organization or a retail, that if, if you had the opportunity to say, that's good, but I like to do it a, a better way. You know, when in the mer merchandising is a, um, uh, it, it, an occupation that r really requires a lot of talent. Exactly. And um, I went to actually uh, a Philadelphia School of Textile and Industry. Um, I actually graduated from there in a short class. It was a, not a very long class at all. And uh, it taught you all about uh, merchandising and how to where to place things and how to do things so that you you they showed up and brought attention to what and spotlighting and you know how to spotlight and how to showcase and how to feature different things and uh, you know and one of the things Pat is don't be afraid if you're starting up your own business don't be afraid to ask the experts you know go to people who have been down that road and say hey what worked for you what didn't work for you tell me what I need to do tell me what I need to do better um, look at my company and do an overall strategic look at my company and say, yeah, you're really not doing this well, but you're doing this well. And how can I improve? And I always tried to listen to those people. You know, you don't, you always don't want to, you always don't agree because different companies, things work different, sure. better for different sure. companies. And um, so that's why you do acquire a lot of mentors, not just one or, or two. And that's the biggest thing that happened to me when I was um, searching for jobs, I um, would would call people that had been big mentors to me, and say, you know, what are my strengths and weaknesses, and what are my assets, and and um, and consequently, I've had people call me and say, hey, I'm interviewing Pat Dingle for a job, and and what are his strengths and weaknesses, and um, and I can say, okay, this is what he does well, this is what he doesn't do well, and I think every one of us um, have our strengths and weaknesses. And um, so 
Yeah, build on your strengths sure. and work on your weaknesses. Build on your strengths and work on your weaknesses is the way I always tell people to do. The old SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And um, I, I think many, many businesses, that's where potentially they should start to really determine what are those strengths and what are those weaknesses and uh, the opportunities and it's interesting that the word the word SWAT that we use as an analysis it's interesting that strengths come first you know and weaknesses come last you dwell on your strengths and you improve on those but you have to recognize your weaknesses but you don't dwell on those you don't you don't dwell on those and say oh I've got way too many weaknesses that's not you you in your analysis that you brought forth and we've done it many times with many different companies you look at the strengths first and you might do two or three pages on strengths these are the good things you know and then you over on your on your uh, missed opportunities you say well these are really the the devil's advocate that I really need to work on they're the ones that's going to get me down so I think though uh, so many times when we start talking about a SWOT analysis most people misunderstand what a SWOT analysis is all about when you're talking about strengths and weaknesses, those are internal to your organization. In other words, that's what you are doing. What are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? You know, all of those things we've just been talking about. The opportunities and threats, those are external to your that's business. That's correct. Those are the things that's going on outside your door that you have little or no control over. Especially yeah. opportunities. Absolutely. But what are your opportunities out there? Who knows? Maybe it's something you're doing. Maybe it's not something you're doing. Um, it could be a growth opportunity and, and threats. Somebody coming in is going to be competition. So when you look at a SWOT analysis, that's your true marketing. Um, you're looking at your strengths and weaknesses, but then you have to look beyond yourself, what's going on in your business environment, and how is it changing. And one of those happens to be, one of the greatest ones happens to be technology because the Internet is out there. And so the Internet has played a key role. When I started at Haskins Tanner, we didn't even know what a computer was, hardly. I mean, we did, but we really didn't. And they were the big box frames. And, I mean, you know, they took a, it took a truckload to bring, bring your computer into you. And a truckload and, of cash. And a truckload of cash. <laughs> yes. And so as the opportunities, as you look at your opportunities, one of the things that you have to look at is how can I sell beyond face-to-face? -face? Mm -hmm. What can I do? How can I get my name out there over the internet with resources like Facebook and Twitter and, and Instagram and how can I, who is watching, who's my market, who's my audience, who are my, who's my target and then like you said go out, go externally and say all right what are my opportunities? Well your opportunity is you better get online and you better because your opportunities are endless mm -hmm. if, if you're out there online. I realize that you know, in my business, I realize that anybody can get online and order anything you want. But you're not you're not keeping your money local, number one. You're not supporting local business. You're not supporting local entrepreneurs. You're not giving back to the community. So you have to say, my what's what's my strength? I'm local. What's my opportunity? Get out beyond And personal service, there's a value to that. Personal service. The customer it used to be, as we were talking before, the customer is always right. It's, that's really, we know that sometimes the customer isn't right. We know that. However, you as the customer always want to be treated like you are right. And one of the things about my business is I treat the customer as the, as the whole source of my business. And Dr. Charles Holzer, who founded Holzer Medical Center, he said, the patient is the center of all we do. And in business, the customer should be the center of everything you do. Everything should, re uh, everything should revolve around the customer. What do I need to do better? What do I need to, you know, well, how can I improve? How can I make this customer return to me time after time after time? Bob, we only have uh, a, a little bit. What is one or two sentences worth what you'd like to leave the individuals? And how can businesses contact you? I think, uh, well, businesses can ta contact me by my phone number, 709-6107. I'll give that one more time. 740-709-6107. They can contact me um, through Facebook and just uh, search Bob Hood and Gallup Police, Ohio. You'll find me there. 
and then you can uh, find me on Twitter, and it's Chaplain Bob Hood, um, and you can find me on Twitter, and I'll be glad to talk to you about a business. I'll be glad to help you. And I think if I could sum up one word, it's customer service and loyalty. We need – loyalty is really – it's a right – a word, broad word, and we could talk a lot about loyalty, but it but seems it rare important. nowadays. Yep. Yeah, no one yeah. is loyal, and so customer service, except my wife, she's loyal to me. Customer service and loyalty. Yep. Bob, I want to thank you very much for for coming on our show. Thank it's you, been Patrick. A, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Pat. Uh, it always is a pleasure. Uh, we're, we're talking with Bob Hood. He's the owner of HT Marketing Services. Uh, his phone number is 740-709-6107. I'm Patrick. I'm Jason. I'm Mike. And I'm Bob. Thank you for listening.